All right, we're continuing our study through uh, the subject of marriage and divorce, and uh, let's uh, begin now in a word of prayer. Father, again, we thank you so much that you've given us your word that we might not be unguided in our lives uh, or misguided, but rather we know what the right path might be. Again, we seek to approach this text being teachable to it, uh, also in, in light of you know being merciful, but also wanting to be holy, Lord, and to do your will, and remembering that our lives are about you and not ourselves, and that if any of us lives, we live to please you and not ourselves. I pray again then we will uh, use language properly and interpret it properly when we approach it in order to understand these issues. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, well, today we're in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7. We're going to go ahead and read the entire uh, chapter now. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now, as a concession, not a command, I say this, I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single, as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. To the married I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. To the rest I say, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever, and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever, and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband, or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Only let each person leave the life that the Lord has assigned to him, and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a bondservant when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you gain your freedom, avail avail yourself of the opportunity. For he who is called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who is free when called is a bondservant of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. So, brothers, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain with God. Now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned, and if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. 
The married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. If anyone thinks that he is not behaving properly toward his betrothed, if his passions are strong and it has to be, let him do as he wishes. Let him marry, it is no sin. But whoever is firmly established in his heart, being under no necessity, but having his desire under control, and has determined this in his heart, to keep her as his betrothed, he will do well. So then he who marries his betrothed does well, and he who refrains from marriage will do even better. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. Yet in my judgment, she is happier if she remains as she is, and I think that I too have the Spirit of God. All right. So uh, we go back to, just to break down the the whole chapter a little bit, uh, verses 1 through 5 are uh, basically Paul saying, uh, that, that those of you who are married can have sex. Now, this is kind of a weird uh, way to introduce this whole thing. He just got done talking about in chapter 6 about uh, prostitution and how uh, each man should not, not be bound to a prostitute, that you can actually become one flesh with a prostitute, and so you should not actually do that. Uh, we're the temple of the Lord. It is wrong to become one flesh with someone who is not the temple of the Lord, the temple of demons. And uh, it makes Christ, the, the, a, a, a body part of Christ, which is the, the body that you have, a part of a prostitute. So it's absolutely evil, should not be done. Um, now, the word there is sexually immoral, so it actually could mean something more than prostitute, but it's likely talking about someone who is not your spouse again. Uh, and so having sex with someone who is not your spouse uh, it, in an unmarried state. And so here we come to chapter 7. And Paul's going to address this issue because it seems that along with this sort of uh, Gnostic view to where you can do anything, um, this more more permissive idea to where, well, you, you, your body is not going to be redeemed and so it doesn't really matter what you do with your body. That's why Paul mentions the resurrection in chapter 6 because his body will be redeemed. Therefore, you're to be sanctified in your body, which is to abstain from sexual morality. He says that elsewhere in Thessalonians. But uh, but the point then is what you do with your body is it, it matters, and so a lot of these Gnostics were like, well, it doesn't really matter, and Paul's saying, no, it does matter, and that's what he deals with in six. But in seven, you also have another type of Gnostic, which is more an ascetic type Gnostic or proto Gnostic or whatever you want to. I mean, there's different views in Greek culture, not just Gnostics, but that that basic kind of Platonic view to where the flesh is irrelevant or it's evil or something. And so you shouldn't participate in anything that has to do with like the physical body and especially something like sex. Here, Paul's going to say in verses one through five that no, you who are married should be participating in sex. You, you should not uh, be basically depriving one another because you're married for a reason. And one of those reasons is that you, um, you provide a shield for one another from sexual immorality from anti-creational sexual activity, from that sort of thing. And so because of that, um, you should indeed have sex with one another, and it's good, and that's what the Lord uh, wants you to do. Well, in uh, verses 6 through 9, he's also going to say, because of that, it's not wrong to marry even. He does say, look, it might be better to stay as I am, uh, that is celibate, um, because, and he's going to go on later on to talk about why that is. He's going to talk about marriage in general versus being unmarried. Uh, but ultimately, he wants to argue that, no, but it's still okay. You're still good. If you're unmarried or you're a widow and therefore, you know, you're not married anymore, um, it, you, you're, you have every right to marry. Go ahead and marry. Now, he's going to say only in the Lord. You, you have a right to marry a fellow Christian. Then in uh, verses 10 and 11, uh, we have the charge to married Christians. So both of them are professed believers. To the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not divorce her husband or be divorced from her husband. But if she does, she, should, she is to remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband is not to divorce his wife. So very, very clear to the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord He's referring back to the Lord's teaching 
that here is the apostolic interpretation of what the Lord had said in the Gospels, specifically in the Gospel of Mark. The wife is not to divorce her husband or be divorced from her husband. If she is for some reason divorced, she didn't get the message or whatever, she is to remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband is not to divorce his wife, period. That's it. So there's the clear teaching in 1 Corinthians 7. Extremely clear. Want to know what to do? You're not to get a divorce. Have you gotten a divorce already because you didn't hear this or something happened? Well, you're to remain on your own or be reconciled to your husband. You're not to be with anyone else, period. That's it. Same thing you're going to see in Romans 7. That's exactly what Paul says there. Uh, if while, while you are married, even though you divorced your husband, doesn't matter, while the husband lives, uh, the law remains that you are bound to your husband, and therefore, if you're joined to another man, you'll be called an adulteress. Very clear. Now, here's where it gets muddied because people are not interpreting the ambiguous in light of the clear. So now he's going to talk about what about a case where you have a believer who's married to an unbeliever? Uh, because the Lord didn't really cover that. He's talking to the covenant community. He doesn't seem to really address that situation. So Paul now is going to say, yeah, the Lord didn't address it. I'm going to address it now. And, he, and here's how he addresses it. To the rest, I say, that is the rest who are married, that, that are not believers, I, not the Lord, so he says, I say, not the Lord, it's emphatic though, I am saying, uh, not the Lord. Now, keep in mind, that doesn't mean he's making a suggestion. He's not saying, well, this is just my opinion. He's saying, I now am commanding you, not the Lord. The Lord commanded you in the, the Gospels, now I'm giving it to you via revelation, I'm telling you what you need to do as an apostle. That if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he is not to divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she is not to divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy, that is the word saint, made a saint, because of his wife and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are saints. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. If they divorce, then let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not bound. Now, we'll, re we'll visit that. That's the, the, the uh, ambiguity there. God has called you to peace, shalom. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether or not you will save your wife? And then he goes on to talk about, I, I think it's connected, goes on to talk about remaining as you are in whatever situation you are and glorifying God basically in that situation. Now, here's the ambiguous part that people often, they, they hit on this and then they want to change the context in order to then change what Paul said before. And then say, well, see that absolute statement, it's not so absolute. Even though Paul was interpreting Christ and telling you, yeah, no, what you read in Christ was not hyperbole. It actually is literally that case, that you are not to divorce and you are not to remarry someone else. You are either to remain, remain single. And Gordon Fee would argue in his commentary that the reason why you're remaining single is to reconcile. It's not just like, oh, yeah, I can be free now and be single. The point is, is that you can maybe reconcile in the future to a, to a believer. Now he's going to go into this, and this is going to be used by people because it's, again, bad hermeneutics. So here we go. Uh, Paul's going to say... In uh, verse 15, but if the unbelieving partner divorces, let them divorce. If they leave, let them divorce. For how do you, or, or sorry, um, in such cases, the brother is not bound. Now, bound tends to be Paul's word in English, if you're reading in English, for being married. And so if you say you're not bound, well, then you're no longer married. And therefore, well, and therefore, here we get, we get with the, the non sequiturs, not necessarily, but people want to then conclude, therefore, you're not bound in marriage, you can get remarried. That's kind of where, the way the argument goes there. Um, here's the problem. The very first one is the one I mentioned. It, it contradicts the absolute statement and the clear statements. 
But if this was clear, then great. I mean, if that was a clear statement, you're no longer bound. The problem is it's not clear. And here's why. Paul never uses the Greek word here, doulao, for being bound in marriage. The word he uses throughout the passage is deo, for being bound in marriage. It's the word he uses in Romans 7 for being bound in marriage, deo. Doulao is never used by Paul anywhere to refer to the bondage of marriage, the, the one flesh union, which is what Paul is really talking about when he's talking about being bound, um, both through the, the, yeah, through the, through the bondage of the, the union. Um, that means this would be the only place that he would ever use it that way. And the problem is Dulao can mean bound or obligated in numerous in, in, in terms of numerous nuances. So it doesn't necessarily mean bound in marriage. It can mean bound to a contract, uh, which is here bound to the contract. In other words, you, ha- you have to keep the contract or you're in sin. So in other words, if someone divorces you, you're in sin. And Paul's saying, no, 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 no. If someone divorces you, you're not in sin. They, they sinned. Uh, and here it's an unbeliever sinning against you. Just You can let them go. I mean, there, you have no obligation to keep them. Again, there's another thing, to, just to keep them there. So in other words, forget just the contract issue. Um, you, have, you have no obligation to keep them there, to somehow convince them to stay. Uh, and maybe even, you know, it would lead to arguments and bullying, which is why he says, no, God's called you to shalom, not, not, uh, not, not that sort of lifestyle. If you, if you need to let them go, they, they don't want to stay, then, then let them go. Um, so you're not bound in that sense. Uh, the fact that he uses deo everywhere else to talk about being bound in marriage and doesn't use it here should be the first sign that maybe he doesn't mean the same thing because they are two separate words. So you're not enslaved, which is actually what dulao means. You're not enslaved to that person. You're not shackled to that person as though, oh no, if they leave, you're going to be in trouble with God. Paul's saying, no, 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 you're the victim in that. Uh, that that's that's them. You're not bound. That doesn't mean, however, that you can get remarried. So it's very important that that the the um, the overarching uh, guiding principle of the two one flesh uh, union then dictates what you do next. Should you be able to get remarried? Well, no, because even though you're not bound to keep them there, you still are one flesh with that person. So as long as they live, which is what Paul keeps saying uh, here and in, in Romans 7, as long as they live, you are bound to that person and either you can be reconciled somehow or maybe they'll go off and you can't be reconciled, but then you are to remain as you are. Now, I realize there's a lot of controversy with that, but that makes sense in terms of what the Lord has taught in the one flesh union. The one flesh union doesn't break because they're an unbeliever, which is what Paul is actually saying here. If it broke because they're an unbeliever, you should just say, oh, well, we're not really married. We can, you, know, you can leave. But Paul says, no, if they actually consent, they're going to remain in the contract. You are still married. In fact, married in such a way that being bound and in the same household uh, through federal headship and whatnot, and also because of the one flesh union between the wife and the, the husband, the husband and wife, then your, your spouse is actually sanctified, maybe made seen as a Christian in that way. And therefore, the original commands to Christians uh, would kick in. And he says also, of course, for your children, you should stay because you're making them saints through federal headship. They, it's important that you be in the household for that reason. And so there's nothing here that indicates, yeah, no, you're free to remarry because the the marriage union, the deo, the, you know, is somehow no longer bound. That's not what he's saying. He doesn't say you're no longer deo. He, he says you're no longer dulao, which is a completely different word. You're, you're not dulao. He doesn't say no longer. You're not dulao. You're not obligated to make them stay. Why? Because God has called you to peace, uh, not to force them to stay. That's why he makes that statement. And so very important, I think, to understand that th- this ambiguous phrase, because you could go either way, really. You could say, well, maybe it's Paul's one time that he uses dulao to refer to the marriage uh, 
the, the marriage union. Well, what determines that? The clear teaching. Would that contradict the clear teaching? Yes. It contradicts the two becoming one flesh union. So if it contradicts the clear teaching, then that's not a viable option. So you throw that, that option in the ambiguous phrase out and it becomes something more of like, you're not obligated to necessarily keep that contract in terms of you have to provide for them or something. Uh, you're not obligated in terms to make them stay, which is I think what it's really saying. Uh, to, to try to force them to stay legally or maybe even physically or whatnot. Paul's saying, no, don't do that. So Paul then will talk about how you should stay as you are. Um, and he is going to talk about that in verses 17 through 24. Where, you know, we read through that, but I'm not going to talk about it much. But the idea, of course, would, would mean that if you're divorced already, uh, let's say your spouse has remarried someone else, or, and I'll, I'll argue later that you've remarried because you didn't know any of this. It doesn't mean somehow let's untangle all the web and everything. It ultimately is going to mean that you just don't do this again. Um, but we'll, again, we'll talk about that. So we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this, this uh, portion of 1 Corinthians 7 when we talk about all that. Verse 25 through 38 is talking about whether uh, one is able to remarry uh, a betrothed virgin. In other words, wh whether someone who's unmarried should get married or not uh, when they're betrothed to a virgin uh, versus or, or should they even seek to be betrothed. And again, we come across another ambiguity, that, and this one actually is made clear, I think, by the context, but the problem is, is that people rip it out of context. So if you look in verses 27 and 28, uh, in verses 27 and 28, Paul's going to make this statement. Now, if I, I, I'm going to read this out of context, and you can see how it's then used. Are you bound to a wife? And by the word, that's the word deo. Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. Now, uh, I appreciate the translation, are you free, are you not free? But the actual word there is loosen, which means are you loosed? For, or, or are you bound to a wife, deo, or are you, uh, do not seek to be loosed? Well, how would you be loosed from a wife? Well, well, you would get a divorce if you're married, right? I mean, that's kind of the idea. Are you loosed from a wife? That is then taking off of the, the first luo, then taking that as divorced. Are you divorced from a wife? Don't seek a wife. Now, up in that point, we might be like, well, that's fine. And Paul's just saying the same thing. Don't, don't seek a wife if you're divorced. Uh, it's okay if, you, uh, um, if you're bound already. Don't seek to be divorced. Um, but the next phrase in 28 is, but if you marry, you have not sinned. And so people are like, oh, well, there you go. So if you're divorced, you can get remarried. Now, if you interpret it that way, you have now contradicted both what Paul says throughout the passage and what the Lord has said through all, I mean, you contradict everything. You have Paul contradict everything that he just said, everything he says later in Romans 7, Everything the Lord has said in Mark and will you know, be repeated in Luke and Matthew, you've just contradicted everything because you haven't sinned because you can get, if you're divorced, you can go ahead and get remarried. Now, here's the problem. The context makes it clear. This is talking about people who are betrothed to a virgin. They've not yet married, but remember in the betrothal period, you are bound in that regard. And they're asking the question, should I stop this? Uh, is it okay that we actually marry? Maybe we shouldn't. Maybe we should break it off. And Paul's saying, no, no, you're bound in that sense. Don't seek to break it off. Are you loosed from a wife? Not meaning, because loose, loose, luo is not necessarily the word for divorce. Luo can mean a billion different things. And remember, the typical word for divorce is apaluo, not, not luo. Um, and so in what way are you loosed? Well, it doesn't just mean that you're free from marriage. You're, you're not, you haven't entered into a contract with a virgin yet. And Paul, that's probably what it means because it's in the context of these contracts with virgins that you would marry. And so, and Paul will even say this. So I'm going to read the whole passage in light of that. And I want you to pay attention. Even look, even the ESV and most commentators will 
actually translate it, the word virgin there as even betrothed because they see in the context that's what it's talking about. Now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord. This is verse 25. But I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. That is, don't, don't get married if you're, if you're uh, just betrothed. Uh, like don't consummate the marriage, just remain as you are. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. That's the word luo there. Are you free from a wife? That is luo, from a wife. Do not seek a wife. But if you do marry, that is you who are betrothed or you who may not be in a, a, a betrothed to someone, but you want to be married to someone, you have not sinned. He's not talking about people who were divorced and are, their, their spouse currently lives. He's not talking about that. He's talking about people who are betrothed, whether or not you want to get married or not. And that's made clear as we continue. Uh, but if you do marry, verse 28, you have not sinned. And if a betrothed woman marries, so you the, you the man marries, uh, you've not sinned. And if your virgin marries, she's not sinned either. Because um, it's not wrong for a virgin to be polluted, because that's, that's the idea that, oh, in, in a platonic setting, sex is polluting something that's pure. And Paul's saying, no, that's not true. She's not sinned. A virgin can actually have sex, get married. Uh, not in that order, obviously, get married and have sex is what the virgin can do. Um, yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it, for the present form of the world is passing away. And so he wants to, if you're going to get married, to, to marry in light of this, to understand that it's not like the, the end all of all things to be married. It's the end all of all things to be devoted to the Lord and to push on to the new heavens and new earth. And this life is passing away in one way or another for all of us. So he says in verse 32, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is worried about worldly things, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord. Now I know the unmarried or betrothed woman, now he's going he's gonna to start flipping to unmarried, meaning widow, because that won't be clear as he, he goes along. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord, because that's what really, really matters in the end. However, he's going to say in verse 36, if anyone thinks he's not behaving properly toward his virgin. So these guys are betrothed. He's bound in that sense, but may, they're asking, should I break it? Um, and Paul's saying you can remain as you are to where you guys don't consummate and you're just there, but even though you were in contract with one another. But if his passions are strong and it has to be, let him do as he wishes. Let him marry her. Let them marry. It is not sin for them to marry, not divorce people, the guy and his virgin bride. But whoever is firmly established in his heart, being under no, necess no necessity, but having his desire under control, and has determined this in his heart to keep her as his betrothed, that's it, not to actually go further, um, he will do well. So then he who marries his betrothed, his virgin, does well, and he who refrains from marriage will do even better. That is because he's got more control of himself and will have more undivided atten attention to the Lord. It's not saying it's better in general for all things. He's just saying in the present situation, undivided attention, control of yourself, that's, that's better than, than not. Um, but obviously marriage is better for other reasons, procreation and all that. Here's why Paul's not contradicting himself. Here we go. Verse 39. Here's, here's where he's going to deal with an actual person who's married, though. A wife is bound to her husband, Deo, as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whomever she wishes only in the Lord. 
Now, what's interesting is that Jewish contracts, I think even the, in the Shemiatic school, were of the nature to say that if you give her a certificate of divorce, she is free to marry whoever she wishes. Paul does not say that, obviously, here. The New Testament pushes against that whole idea and says, no, if the husband dies, she is free to marry whomever she wishes, as long as he's a Christian. Yet in my judgment, she's happier if she remains as she is. So here's, here's the widow that he was maybe referring to as the unmarried before. Uh, she's happier if she remains as she is, and I think that I too have the Spirit of God, or I consider that I have the Spirit of God as well. So very important. This passage is not contradicting, and these ambiguities should not be interpreted to change the context, which is ultimately what people want to do. They want to change the context in order to change the clear statements which means the clear statements are being interpreted in light of ambiguities. The, the ambiguous now is becoming the context. The problem is, is we don't really know what the ambiguous says. We can get it from context. I think the last ambiguity is pretty clear, but even then, it's, it's still somewhat ambiguous. And so the, the issue is, do I then ignore the, the clear teaching that's absolute for something that may or may not go against it? Or do I say, no, whatever is ambiguous needs to be interpreted uh, consistently with what is clear? So that if Paul says, you are not to get married, remarried, you are not to get divorced. If you're divorced, you're not to get remarried, you remain as I am, or you reconcile with your husband. That the wife is bound as long as her husband lives. She's only free to marry if he dies. Then when he says, you're not obligated in a marriage union... Uh, he's not saying you can get remarried. And when he's talking about, are you loosed from a wife and it's not sin to remarry, he's not talking about people who are divorced and their spouse still lives. That's consistent with the clear. So even though you might have multiple options for what the ambiguous terms might mean, your, your, your options actually are limited by the clear. That's not what most people do in our culture. It's not mo what most commentators do because they're not obeying that hermeneutical rule. Because in the end, they want something else to be the case. Or maybe they're just not practicing the rule. I mean, people are inconsistent, even, even scholars. But the point is, is that we take what is clear, that becomes the guideline for what our options are when we interpret the ambiguous. Same thing in Matthew 19 and Matthew 5. The, the clear needs to be what guides us, not distorted and muddied by what we can make the ambiguous say. You can make scripture say anything if you, if you break the context away from it. You can make scripture say anything. And if you distort the clear with the ambiguous, you are breaking the context away from the ambiguous. You're actually saying the ambiguous, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break away from the context, interpret what that can mean apart from any context, then I'm going to shove it back into the context and reinterpret the clear statements. That's not good exegesis. You don't break anything from the passage. You read it all as one thing. And you, read, you interpret it in light of one another. And you always, always, always limit your options on what the ambiguous means by what the clear has stated. Well, that's 1 Corinthians 7 in a nutshell when it pertains to marriage and divorce. I realize this is a hard topic for people. I'm not trying to be callous about it. I'm just trying to get to the meaning of Scripture so that we can be guided, I think, in this. Because there, there frankly, is not a lot of guidance in the area. I think it's important for us to look at this with good hermeneutics, good exegesis, pull out what it's actually saying, and say, okay, well, this is what the Lord has called me to. And again, it may not seem fair to you. Life is not fair. Some of us are sick with chronic illnesses. Some of us will die early. Some of us uh, don't get riches, but we get poverty. Some of us, you know, yeah, you don't get the same life as everybody else. And you may think it stinks, but here it is. And it's for you to glorify the Lord with it, whatever he gives you. I realize it's hard, but again, life is hard. And so don't look at this and be like, well, I don't want to do that because that, that's not the life that I want. It's the life that God has given you. Um, seek to obey him 
the most, you know, you know, to the utmost, but ultimately maybe you will have someone divorce you and be unjust to you and cause your life to take a dramatic turn to where you don't get the life that these other people get. I, I've got to tell you, Christian, that's your life as a Christian. Forget this issue. That's your life in general. None of us is going to get the life that we wanted. No one who is in Christ will get the life they wanted. And I would be suspect of anyone who does and claims to be a Christian. This is the devil's time. He is the God of this world. His children prosper here. Not you. You're a stranger. You're a foreigner. You're someone passing through his world and you don't belong here and he's hostile toward you. And so are his children. And so is the fallen world. It is used as an instrument in his hand, but you ultimately have to believe that God is sovereign over all of that. And even the devil himself is being used as an instrument for his own glory through your life, through your suffering. We are called to suffer. Let us not fall into the trap of the reformers and the later Puritans who are arguing that, yeah, no, marriage is about, you know, pleasure and, uh, and having delight in life. Well, certainly it can be, but that's not the end goal so that we understand that we are born in Christ to suffer. And that it's the world that we're looking for that has not come about yet. It's not the, it's not the world that has been completed yet. It's the world in chaos in which we dwell, and therefore we're going to suffer because of that. Suffer hardship, suffer illness, suffer death. And that's what Paul's trying to point out. The world's passing away. Have that as your guiding principle for whatever commands God gives you. If the rich young ruler had realized the world is passing away, do you think he would have bowed his head and walked away because he thought his life was in riches? No, he would have said, well, all this stuff isn't worth anything anyway. I, I should probably use it for good because everything's passing away. 2,000 years later, he's been in the grave. What was the better choice? The riches or Christ? My appeal to you is that when we go through passages like this, look, if you want to disagree with exegesis, I'm not quite sure how you would do that, but feel free. But don't disagree because you want a different life, because you want something else, because you've misunderstood what life is about. It's not about you. You are his image. You are meant to glorify him. It's about him and the exaltation of him, whether you are married or whether you are single, whether you are widowed or whether you are divorced, whatever it may be, whether you have sex the rest of your life or you never have it again, it is about him and him alone. That's my encouragement for you today. When you read these passages, I know they're hard, but that's what Christ has called us to. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, again, we thank you for your word, Lord. I pray that uh, I, I'm sure I inadequately explained everything, but that you would uh, really communicate it to the hearts and minds of your people. Uh, help them be more devoted to you, to lift you up, to enthrone you on their lives as they seek to not only believe what is right, but to live out what is right in love of you and love of your people. For your glory, Lord, and your glory alone, in Jesus' name, amen.